So uh, I, I showed this yesterday. You know, these are uh, very low risk, uh, uh, suggesting that uh, observation or watchful waiting uh, is appropriate unless the estimated survival is more than 20 years. This is for low risk disease where uh, the thresholds were set at about 10 years. I guess the first question is, well, how do you figure out what a guy's life expectancy is? And there's a bunch of different calculators out there. You could use the social security calculator, but really all you put in there is your gender and your date of birth. And, and there's not a lot of very individual specific information. Uh, I, I went to one of the uh, annuity companies and uh, they have a much better one. So in, in their uh, uh, tool, you put in your gender, your race, your age, your BMI, your education, marital status, income level, the number of times you work out per week, some self-assessment of your overall health status, whether you have diabetes, how many drinks you have per week, and whether you were ever a smoker and so forth. And when I did that, I got 12 extra years of expected life expectancy using the uh, uh, blueprint than, than if I used uh, the Social Security. And I'm sure many of those factors uh, really do matter for uh, overall life expectancy. So uh, once you figure out what the life expectancy is, and then you might want to say, well, have I accurately characterized the tumor in terms of knowing how aggressive it is? And one good way to do that is to do a, a quality biopsy. And we talked a lot about that yesterday, whether it's transperineal or MRI targeted, this, that, and the other. But then you could also consider getting some of these uh, genetic tests. And you can see uh, from the NCCN uh, uh, guidelines panel, the decipher test, the oncotype, the Prolaris, and the Promark are at least considered reasonable tests to consider. So I thought I would just a few slides to summarize each one of those and then wrap up by talking about some of the dilemmas, notwithstanding that all of the studies, you know, all of the tests look like they actually would help you. Prolaris test, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it in the cell, cell cycle progression pathway. Uh, first uh, evaluated in men who underwent a TERP in the early uh, 1990s, and, and uh, you could see how you could differentiate men who had a high chance of prostate cancer uh, mortality versus those who had a lower one. Then uh, this was replicated uh, in another cohort of men who had needle biopsies in the early 1990s. In a more contemporary uh, study uh, look, looking at the capture uh, database, you can see that uh, the, the, the score differentiated even among men who had low risk or intermediate or high risk disease, what their disease course is apt to be in terms of uh, progression-free survival. Uh, it's uh, possible to even uh, uh, characterize patients better than the uh, CAPRA score would. And I'm certain that everybody has seen these reports uh, from uh, Prolaris that talk about your uh, mortality risk and also whether the uh, genetic signature of that particular patient's uh, tumor is uh, better or, or worse than the average person within the AUA uh, risk uh, category. I don't want to dwell very much on that. Uh, like all of these uh, tests, and I'll show you this in each case, knowledge of the result of the tests seems to change people's attitude as to whether the patient should be treated or not. Now, we don't know if we're making the right decision, but uh, when you use this, the Polaris test, if you started with patients you considered who should not have any intervention, 24% of the time, uh, that decision was changed. On the other hand, of men who, thought, who were thought to have a significant enough disease requiring intervention, 14% of the time that decision was changed uh, to uh, active surveillance. Got to put an asterisk on that. We don't know if those are the correct decisions. So knowledge of the test does change behavior. But is it right or wrong? That's another matter. Uh, the uh, Oncotype uh, GPS uh, test, uh, again, very, very similar. You could differentiate uh, 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 the, per, the, the behavior of tumors uh, within uh, each of these uh, NCCN uh, categories. And again, this is the latest report that uh, in addition to talking about um, the risk of death and metastases, which are very, very low, for example, in this patient, the probability of finding adverse pathology, which means either high stage disease or the presence of, uh, of uh, uh, aggressive uh, pattern four and five. But notice that this endpoint, finding aggressive disease, is not, uh, as, uh, is not necessarily worrisome because even though a considerable number of patients may have that, notwithstanding that, they're 
15 year chance of death and so forth is very, very low. Same sort of uh, clinical decision making and trial uh, that shows that uh, uh, you, know, you could see the proportion of patients uh, who were offered active surveillance once the results of the uh, GPS score were known. So for low risk disease that was up to 90, very low risk disease up to 90%, low risk disease up to two thirds, and intermediate risk about a third of the patients were considered uh, appropriate for surveillance. Now again, we don't know if those are the right decisions. Same thing here, the ProMark test just looks at some proteins. Again, it can differentiate a risk stratification within the different NCCN categories. This is the one test I've never used, so I, I actually never saw a report. I just took this from the web page, and again, it, it describes uh, how uh, your patient's apt to do if he was within those given uh, NCCN categories. And the final test is, is the uh, Decipher test. Again, this is able to differentiate uh, behavior on the basis of the genomic, what's referred to as the genomic classifier score. You can see how it segregates there. Uh, in making the decision about uh, whether adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy is necessary for somebody who had a radical prostatectomy, you can see if your genomic classifier score is very low, it doesn't matter whether they get adjuvant or salvage. On the other hand, if your genomic classifier score is high, uh, patients do a lot better if they get early adjuvant radiation therapy compared to uh, delayed uh, salvage radiation therapy. Same sort of thing about the treatment impact. Uh, you can see uh, the proportions of patients uh, whose uh, management was changed given the results of the test. And, and this is uh, an example of a uh, decipher report. Now this is a report to decide whether to use adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy. The, the, the genomic classifier can also be used to determine active surveillance, and this was the very first study about two years ago. The ROC curve for making that decision is shown here, and that uh, red one is the combination of the NCCN classification and uh, your decipher score. It's actually based on a pretty small number of uh, patients and it's a little mind-boggling to me that there was a, at least one guy in the cohort who had high NCCN risk classification, but when his decipher score came back, it was, uh, it was uh, put him in the very low risk category. That's a little surprising to me. The biggest problem with these tests are that they really haven't been compared one to the other. And I think this is a very important paper from, the, uh, from European Urology. It's, uh, it's about a year old now. The, this is just four men who had radical prostatectomies, and as you know, most men who have radical prostatectomy have multiple tumors. And what the, what the investigators did was they, they looked at the oncotype score of each tumor within the prostate and the Prolaris score and the Decipher score of all the tumors. And you can see that within the prostate, uh, just on the basis of oncotype, some of the tumors were favorable, this one wasn't favorable. And you can see the, the heterogeneity for oncotype. You can see the heterogeneity when you use Prolaris. You can see the heterogeneity when you look at the decipher. And then when you look at it this way, for example, the oncotype score said that this particular tumor was favorable. The Prolaris score said it was unfavorable, very much unfavorable. The decipher score was a little closer to neutral on that. So you can see that not only are the tumors very heterogeneic, heterogeneic, but when you analyze them with these different tools, you're apt to get different results. And that, to me, makes it uh, uh, questionable whether these should be used as a, uh, as a standard in managing patients. Now, the final slide, uh, this is actually from Eric Klein, and I disagree uh, with this, and I, maybe we could talk about it at the uh, critique panel later. I, I think the middle column is reasonable. You don't need this test for very low risk disease and for most men uh, who have low risk disease. Maybe uh, if you have large volume Gleason 6 and an intermediate risk where you really are on the basis of the clinical criteria in an ambiguous spot, they may, that might be reasonable. Now what is the best endpoint? This is the column I disagree with completely because to me, Adverse pathology is a really early intermediate endpoint. And as we showed, even from the uh, uh, genomic health uh, report, uh, even if you have a relatively high chance of adverse pathology, 
Notwithstanding that, you had very, very low 15-year chances of metastases and death, and that's what really matters. And so for me, I would prefer uh, the tests that look at metastasis, that's the, basically the decipher test, or mortality, and that's basically the Polaris test. But that's just a personal opinion, and I think it might be ha a good thing to chat about at the uh, critique panel later on. So once again, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity, and thanks for coming. <laughs>